Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2017 Honors Lecture Series on Global Engagement. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Um, I'm joined today by Dean John Vile, who's with us, and also Associate Dean Kim Sequoia, visiting us from the Jones College of Business. So welcome, gentlemen, to the class. And this is a class. It, in addition to this being a lecture series that's open to the public, uh, this is a class that is required of all students graduating from the University Honors College, and it's a one-hour class, can be taken up to three times by students um, in the Honors College. So today, um, I've, our speaker has a few things to say to you before I formally introduce him. So David McCarter. I want you to take a moment to write down your perceptions and your interpretations of what you saw on the flyer and the person standing in front of you. Take a moment. Write down what you thought. Write down what you interpreted when you saw me walk up. If you haven't finished, keep going. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Name man Daoud makar garast. Baroi du sal Afghanistan zindigi kar dam bai se khedmat kar reza karane sul. Da Kabul, Inglisi, da Maktabi Technik sonui dars tadam. I'm David McCarter. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Afghanistan from 1976 to 78. I taught English at the Afghan Institute of Technology in Kabul, Afghanistan, long before most people realized where Afghanistan was. It is my true pleasure today to introduce someone whom I've known for over 16 years now. Uh, Dr. David McCarger is Emeritus Professor of Education from Tennessee State University, where he taught multicultural education and the teaching of English as a second or foreign language for 40 years, and he's recently retired. I didn't teach there for 40 years, taught at TSU for 25. Total, total time. Very long uh, career. After earning his PhD in curriculum in teaching English as a second language from UCLA, he taught at the secondary school level through the doctoral level, developed curricula and instructional materials for ESL, EFL programs, designed and implemented ESL and EFL teacher education programs, and administered ESL, EFL teacher education programs, and researched the role of culture in teaching and the educational beliefs of teachers and students. Having taught on four continents, Dr. McCarger speaks German, Persian, and Arabic. And we had a signing of the Book of Town and Gown uh, just before class today, and Dr. McCarger signed his name both in English and in Persian. Uh, if you ever get a chance to look at our Book of Town and Gown, you're going to see that there are a lot of uh, languages represented in that book, including Cherokee. But I, I think uh, Dr. McCarger's is the first that is in Persian. He also has some facility with Korean, Japanese, Polish, French, and Spanish. Now, I first came to know Dr. McCarger when I started Taekwondo in 2001. So that's where our association began. And I have to say that, that David McCarger is one of the best instructors that we have at Shins Martial Arts in in Nashville. Uh, he's particularly good at focusing on the fundamentals of movements and explaining things very, very clearly so that people can understand them and taking things to a deeper level. Uh, he, is, he is an instructor. Not only that, but he is a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo. And when I, would, when I asked him for information about, and I knew that already, when I asked him for information about uh, for, the, for the bio today, I learned some other things, too. In addition to being a fifth Don in Taekwondo, he's a first Don in Goju Shorei Weapon Systems, a first Q in Aikido, 
and first Q in Shorinru Karate. And he's still going. So, uh, and, and I still get to see him um, once a week or every so, so often at Taekwondo. Throughout his life, Dr. McCarger has remained committed to volunteerism and public service. And this commitment led to more than 40 years of participation in such organizations as Teacher Corps, Peace Corps, and Rotary International. His presentation today is entitled Turning Points, Afghanistan and Beyond. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McCarter. Okay. What did you think when I asked you to write stuff down? Any of volunteers? Yeah? I assumed you were a veteran. Okay. Yeah, did you ride motorcycles? <laughs> okay. What else? We're a Predators fan. Ah, thank you. You noticed my hat. What else? Yeah. I can tell you have some good stories to tell. Ah, all right. What else? Hippie. <laughs> Hippie. I can't imagine how you got that idea. What happened when I opened my mouth and started speaking in Persian? You didn't understand a word I said, except maybe one person understood the very first phrase. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the Arabic traditional beginning of a formal uh, presentation, also the first surah. So what is that all about? Why would I ask you to think about these things? Not a trick question. We make assumptions. We have expectations. You expect doctors to have ties and jackets. You expect them to have a certain visual presentation. Why did I violate those expectations? Because I can, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Gets your attention? Yeah. Yes, there it was very intentional. I spoke with uh, Dr. Phillips about it before I ever came in. Ah, expectations and assumptions sometimes are right and sometimes they're not. Sometimes we're aware of when they're right. Many times we find out after the fact that we were wrong. I'm sorry? Don't judge, a book by its cover. don't judge a book by its cover and don't trust your own expectations. Be aware of them. Expectations are a form of bias. And you need to be aware of those biases in order to check your expectations, to check your perceptions, to check what you see against what you thought. I want you to write down a word in your notes. <laughs> Exigency. Have you heard it before? E-X-I-G-E-N-C-Y. Exigency. E-X-I-G-E-N-C-Y. I'm going to read you a dictionary definition of it. I need a surface to put this stuff down on. Miriam Webster says, it's a state of affairs that makes urgent demands. Another online source said, a mixture of excitement and emergency, a sudden urgent crisis, comes from Latin. Exigentia, meaning urgency, and the verb exigere, meaning to demand or 
and then, and then, or require. I have my own definition for it. It is a situation that evokes response, that evokes engagement, that invites people to go, oh. And for years at TSU, I had students who called me Dr. Exigency. <laughs> because in my teacher education classes, one of my main function, functions was to help students understand the concept of exigency, to see exigencies where they existed in their teaching environment, to create exigencies in their teaching environment, and to use exigencies as the driving force behind how we teach. If you think about it, how many of you, and I don't need to see hands on this one, have ever had a professor that taught from the same stale set of notes that they had used for 10 or 15 or 20 years? And the presentation and the delivery had zero exigency beyond your getting a grade, beyond your taking notes, beyond your taking a test. And so exigencies are crucial in teaching. <coughs> Were you expecting me to do that? Why did I do it? It required a response. Required a response. <coughs> exigencies can be external exigencies. Something that you see. They can be positive or negative. So think for a minute about visual expectations or visual uh, exigencies. If you see a bus about to run over somebody, you reach to pull them back, if you can. I mean, you don't want to get run over by the bus yourself. Go to the other extent, extreme. How many of you have heard a little baby laugh, seen a little baby smile. What does it do to you? For most people, it opens up your heart and you go, oh wow, that is so cool. I've got a 19 month old granddaughter. Ooh. They can be physical. Dr. Phillips and I have taken more than one blow to the head. I guarantee you it will get your attention. <coughs> On the positive end, how many of you have ever been sick and had your mother come in when there was nothing else to do? She'd given you the aspirin. She'd <laughs> given you the water. She'd done all of the things that she could do. And she sat down on your bed and put her hand on your forearm. What was your response? Was there a kind of, oh, okay, I may not feel good, but boy, that's comforting. Exigencies can also be something that is not an external visual thing, but a proprioceptive thing. How many of you know what that is, proprioceptive? Your body has three, you raised your hand? It's, it's like um, your body's response to emotion. Okay. I, I have vertigo problems, which is one of the reasons why I have a cane. I was in a car accident back in 2011, which is why I wound up retiring. Because I have vertigo and it can be set off by flashing lights, moving lights, lack of a vertical and horizontal axis in my visual field, etc. 
So there are three components of balance. Your visual system, your middle ear, and last but not least is the proprioceptive system. That's the body's feedback mechanism that tells you where you are in space. Have you ever had your footing go out from underneath you or get shaky all of a sudden? I had a ladder go out from underneath me. My body perceived what was going on and it was an exigency that made me grab for something. So exigencies can be positive or negative. They come from outside you. They can also come from inside you. I want you to think about the last time you had a stomach virus and your gut was sitting there going. That's not an external thing, is it? But if you needed to find a restroom real fast, you were pretty motivated, weren't you? Okay. You can also have cognitive exigencies. Have you ever had somebody say something where you went, ooh, that's cool. I see some real importance in that. Or have you woken up in the middle of a night out of a dream with an idea that was really powerful? Or had somebody make an analogy or found an analogy yourself that made pieces sensible? Or had one of those click moments where all the pieces to a puzzle just sort of went boom and the puzzle became clear. The image made sense. These are exigencies in my way of thinking. They ask you to respond in some way. So why bother with these ex exigencies? What do you think? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. They're a strong way to influence people. Teaching is more powerful with exigencies. Finding them, creating them, exploiting them for teachable moments. Why else should you bother in your own personal daily life? They can encourage you to look at yourself and change. They can become points. They can take you from a path that you're on and redirect you either in a brand new path or on a tangent that you hadn't imagined. I look at my life and I look back on it through the lens of exigencies and I find a couple of things. First of all, I'm not aware, I wasn't consciously aware of all the exigencies that I encountered. Some of them, in retrospect, were pretty powerful. My folks moved a lot when I was a kid, lived in 12 different places before I graduated from high school. What did it teach me? There were exigencies that led me to learn or understand the world differently. What do you think those might be? Different cultures. Different cultures. Within the United States, different cultures, wherever you go. What else? Different needs. Different worldviews. 
different ways of using language. I went from Detroit, Michigan, downtown Detroit, Michigan, very heterogeneous community, heavily black, heavily white, and a bunch of Jews. And you had to learn to function in all of those communities or you got your butt kicked in all of those communities. I also had to learn how to talk differently with different communities. Moved from Detroit to outside of Boston. I still can pack my car and have it, yeah. <laughs> it was becoming a linguistic chameleon. You had to learn how to fit in. I've been all over the world. Guess what? You have to learn how to fit in. All right. I've already said that exigencies are turning points, potentially. How many of you have heard the phrase carpe diem? What does it mean? Seize the day. Mm, seize what? How do you know what to seize? You look for the exigency. You look for that which evokes a response from you. And if you don't see it, either you're not looking hard enough or you need to think about creating it. Louis Pasteur said, in the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. What do you think he meant? Yeah? Someone who's adaptable, or someone who isn't adaptable won't be able to um, receive as much out of an experience. Okay. Yeah, what else? Okay, a mind that is prepared to see something, to observe something, has an easier time seeing it. In a way, that's a kind of expectation, isn't it? You have a framework for observation. And you have to prepare that framework. I don't care what field you're in. Doesn't matter whether it's English, medicine, physics, you have to be prepared to observe. That doesn't mean you don't pay attention to things that are not expected, but you have a mindset that leads you to look for certain things within your structure. The problem with that is that those expectations sometimes lead you into very strange places. My son went to Martin Luther King High in Nashville. I used to drive my pickup truck, park by the school. He'd come out and jump in the truck and we'd head off. I usually parked with the passenger side facing the street so that he could get in easily without any mussing around. One day I was sitting there and I realized that I had not unlocked the door so that he could get in. I reached over and I unlocked the door. As I did that, a middle-aged black woman was walking down the sidewalk and she screamed at me in the top of her voice, not all black people are going to rob you, you know. What had she perceived? She perceived that I had locked the door when in fact I had done the opposite. Be 
became a teaching moment that I've used for 20 years. So what do I think about these exigencies? In the field of life, only the prepared mind, heart, soul handles exigencies well. <coughs> Unless you are seeking, using, and maybe creating exigencies for yourself and others, what a sterile way to go about life. So, turning points. A couple of notable ones that I can look back on. I went to high school in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Born in University of Michigan Hospital. Go blue. I went to Michigan State University in East Lansing. Why do you think I did that? instead of going to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I did have the choice. How many of you as undergraduates want to go to school where your parents might be looking over your shoulder? Hmm. A lot of people will answer no. So I went just far enough down the road that I was close to home, but not so close that they would be sitting on the doorstep when I came out maybe after a party some night. Let's see if I can find the right set of pictures here. All right. High school, lifeguard, bleached hair from the sun. Left and went to Michigan State University and walked out looking like that. <laughs> Walter Cronkite was our commencement speaker. A fiery anti-war speech. So what was the exigency here? Well. I got out of the dorm and went to a co cooperative house because I wanted more freedom. Cooperative houses are kind of like dorms, but they're run by the students, and the students do all the maintenance and cooking and everything. That's where I met my wife. Turning point. When I met my wife, she wasn't completing school at the same time I was. That's us. Yes, it's coming back. <laughs> Wedding. This is what I looked like when I went to Peace Corps. We were not allowed to have beards or long hair because they didn't want us looking like hippies, as if that would change who we were. How did I get to that point? To that picture. I got a job teaching English at Bay City Central High School in Michigan. At the end of the school year, they pink slipped all of the new teachers because the bond, uh, school bond uh, had failed in the election. I was one of the new teachers, so I got pink slipped. I had been married less than three months. We went back to Michigan State because my wife had one semester left to do. She didn't know what she wanted to do, so she signed up for Teacher Corps. If she was going into Teacher Corps, I was going into Teacher Corps. Teacher Corps didn't want to have anything to do with us because I already had an education degree, and they wanted us to do it their way. I was pumping gas. So we had money coming in so that we could pay her tuition and have food on the table and be able to live in the married student housing. One night, about 10 o'clock at night, after I had been pumping gas for 
four or five hours. I came home and my wife met me halfway from the apartment to the car and said, there's a guy on the phone who wants to know whether you want to have the government pay for your master's degree and go and be a Peace Corps volunteer in Afghanistan. Pardon my language, but quit with me. But it was true. They had found our names from Teacher Corps, and it was a combined Teacher Corps Peace Corps program to prepare people to be English as a second language teachers in Afghanistan. ESL had not been on my radar. Peace Corps was not on my radar. Exigency. Two weeks later I was in Buffalo. About three weeks later my wife joined me. We spent a year as teacher corps volunteers. During that time, I knew that I was going to have to shave my hair, cut my hair, shave my beard. So one afternoon, just for the heck of it, I decided, all right, enough, let's get this over with. So I went to a barber and I got a haircut. I came back to the apartment and my wife freaked out. She thought someone was breaking in. She did not recognize me. That's what I looked like. And if you go back to the picture of the long hair and the beard at the wedding and go to that, you can see why she might be a little bit surprised. Deflection point, turning point, exigency. At the end of teacher corps, they sent us home for one month to see our folks before we went overseas. During that time, my wife went down to Florida and I went to uh, Minnesota. My folks were living outside of Minneapolis. She went boating with her brothers and sisters to do some water skiing. Some idiot ran over her tow rope and it wrapped around her thumb and it buzzsawed down to the bone, shredding nerves, muscles, ligaments and tendons. They took her to a small hospital where they sewed up the outside of the thumb and did nothing to repair the circulation, did nothing with the nerves. It swelled up like a sausage when you cook it. And she talked with the doctor, the orthopedist, and he said, well, they're going to wait for it to die and then transplant one of her toes onto her thumb. I was down there in 24 hours. He was fired. I found a new doctor. He saved her thumb. She can use it, not completely, but he saved the nail and transplanted a nerve and she has a functional hand. That delayed our departure for Afghanistan, exigency. What did I do in the meantime? We were in Florida. Her brother was a martial artist. I started martial arts in January of 1974 because I had time on my hands and I had always been interested in it. And so I got to spend nearly a year in my first Taekwondo school. A couple months, three months, four months into that, I was a green belt. And my brother-in-law and I went out one night and partied very hard. I went into class the next day and I had no balance, no speed, no perception, no power. They walked up one side of me and down the other all night long. Literally kicked my behind. I was sitting on the edge of the training space afterwards, I said, what the hell just happened to me? And it was kind of like one of those cartoon things where you see a light, ball, uh, a light bulb and a little bell that goes ding. Guess what? You remember what you did last night? 
can't imagine why you're having problems today. <laughs> Exigency. Turning point. Lifestyle change. It began one of the two threads that has gone through my entire life. Martial arts and teaching. There's a third one that's not quite as long uh, in duration, and that's service. Teacher Corps, Peace Corps, Rotary. I continued teaching and learning martial arts when I went into Peace Corps. This was my Taekwondo class in Afghanistan in 1977. I was a brown belt at that time. First two people on the left are Peace Corps volunteers. Everybody else is an Afghan. Deflection point, turning point. <coughs> so, what do you do with these things? You look for exigencies. We lived in a house. They paid for our housing and our food, and in Afghanistan it was different from most Peace Corps countries because uh, the, the health conditions were so bad that you had to have a cook to prepare the food safely so you wouldn't get sick, but you still did anyway. Seven bouts of amoebic dysentery in two years. Each one of those, I guarantee you, was an exigency. <laughs> this is the view from our street. Those are the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Kabul is 7,500 feet up in the Hindu Kush in a valley. This is the front of our house. We had a bedroom, we had a living room, dining room, and a kitchen, and a bathroom. The gentleman in this picture, you may not be able to see it real well, uh, his name was Saeed Muhammad. He was our cook. His wife was Zalaija. As was the tradition in Afghanistan, they lived in a single room attached to our compound. And then they had a baby. And then his brother came. And her mother came. And there were like six people living in this one little room. And I was feeling really, really guilty. Here were all these people crammed into this one little room. So I went to my landlord and I said, hmm, if I provide the labor Will you provide the materials so I can add a room on? And he kind of tilted his head and looked at me and said, okay. So we poured a concrete slab. We built cinder block walls. And as we were doing all of this, every once in a while, Saeed Muhammad would look over me at me like, and I didn't get the hint. The hint was, why the hell are you doing this? I don't want this. We finished the room. Nice roof, nice window, nice door. The, they proceeded to use storage and lived in the same room. And I was dumbfounded. From my perspective, why wouldn't you want to use that extra room to live in and have some people in that room and some people in the other room? or use that as a kitchen, and they didn't do it. And I went to the school where I was teaching, and my Persian teacher happened to be a colleague, and he looked at me when I told him this story, and he busted out laughing. He said, Dave, 
for their whole lives. Their families have lived in one room. And in the winter they have this uh, blanket that covers everybody with a, a charcoal uh, uh, kind of brazier that they put in the middle of the room and there's a hole in the uh, uh, blanket and everybody <laughs> sleeps with their feet in to the charcoal brazier. And he said to me, who are they going to exclude? Which family member are they going to ostracize by doing what you wanted them to do or you expected them to do? It would violate everything in their existence and culture for them to degrade a family member that way. Ding. Exigency. Go back and look at your expectations. Go back and look at, even with good intent, what your exigency or what your expectations led you to do that was way, way off mark. If I've learned anything about these things in the last 40 plus years, is that you have to go looking for it. But you also have to be ready to take advantage of things that you weren't expecting. And carpe diem. Questions? Yeah. Well, uh, how do you decide between multiple exigencies that present you which one to choose? Depends upon how urgent the situation is. If you're in, in, in a situation that is a crisis, depends on your training. If you're a trained first responder, you know how to triage what's in front of you. If you're trained in the military, you know how to triage what's in front of you and find that which is the highest priority. But if you're like most people, you don't have that kind of training. Last night in Las Vegas, did those people have training on how to respond? No. So what did they do? They did the best they could. What was the highest priority? Staying safe and keeping your loved ones safe. Get the hell out of there. When you have time, you have the luxury of looking at your priorities. You have the luxury of looking at what your choices might be in a more relaxed manner. I had a choice about Afghanistan. I could have said no. But boy, was that interesting. I wanted it. And I went for it. it changed my life. So I don't know whether that was a, a complete answer to your question, but I don't know that there is really a complete answer. Sure. Uh, you brought up uh, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So if their exigency is to stay safe, mm -hmm. do we have an exigency in order to prevent that or curtail it in the future? I believe so. How can we do that? I think that we have to take a realistic look at gun laws in this country. And I know that's controversial. I know there are a lot of people who aren't going to agree with me on that. They say guns don't people, uh, kill people, people kill people. But if that guy didn't have 10 loaded either automatic or semi-automatic weapons in that room, he could not have killed more than 50 people and injured 500 plus more. And I think that it's a piece of semantics to say guns don't kill people, people kill people because the bottom line is the result. And I know it's controversial, and I'm, I'm more than happy to engage in that co uh, conversation. I'm a gun owner. Hippie freak, Peace Corps volunteer, very liberal gun owner. I'm sorry? that lived in Afghanistan, <laughs> and who, I didn't talk about this, 
took my son to the hospital late one night because he had an ear infection. Driving the 20 minutes to the hospital along the side of a road, uh, took the back way, 2 o'clock in the morning, semi on the left-hand side of the road, man on his back at a phone booth. And I said, oh man, something's wrong here. So I did a U-turn, pulled up behind the truck, locked the door with my son inside, and went up. And this guy was bleeding to death. I thought someone had cut his throat. Turns out that somebody had shot him for a watch and forty dollars. Left nine kids. Dialed nine one one. They came, took him away. He died. I wound up having to testify in court. They got put away. Handguns aren't the solution to everything. Bias, I admit it. Next. Questions? Yeah, please. Time for one or two more. Would you recommend the Peace Corps? For Absolutely. Absolutely. I will, however, say that women need to be careful which country they go to because there are conditions for women in some countries that put them at risk. And it's not a religion thing, it's a culture thing, and it's an isolation thing. Because when you're out there by yourself and you don't have an immediate local support system, it can get dicey sometimes. I will leave you with something. Dr. Phillips, if you would. You saw me come in with this cane. I have it for a reason. I have vertigo. I have bad knees. I also train in the Goju Shoei weapons system. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever underestimate an old man with a cane. <laughs> Thank you.